We're in chapter 3, if you'd like to turn down the Word of God with me this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're dealing uh, with the first, uh, well, we're dealing with the 17 qualifications for the pastor, referred to here as the bishop. In the New Testament church, the 17 scriptural qualifications contained in verses 1 to 7 of 1 Timothy 3, also restated in Titus, one of the other pastoral epistles, in chapter 1 of Titus, verses 6 to 9. We opened this up last week, well, over the last couple of weeks, of course. But let's read the first seven verses together this morning to remind ourselves of, uh, of what the Lord is calling us two as a church and as a man in the ministry and any men who the Lord may be calling to the ministry, what exactly does God require of the men he calls into the ministry? First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, the word of God, God says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, and hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And we'll end our reading there this morning, and God is always pleased to bless the reading of his true, perfect, preserved word this morning, and we're thankful to have that before us. The final authority to all mankind, whether they accept it or not, by the way, it is the, it is the authority by which God will judge mankind. It is the final authority to all Christians, whether they love God's word or whether they don't. It is the final authority. Therefore, it is God's full word, final word, about his instructions to us as the New Testament church, as we're looking at the church that Jesus Christ himself is building. So uh, the pastor's qualifications we deal with as we continue on this morning. And as I've said, it, it has not been my intention. I don't feel that we're in a place in the church where we need to spend 17 weeks doing one sermon on each, or at least one sermon on each one of these qualifications. And it's not that they're not important, they are, but I don't think we're at a place where we need to spend that time each week in that this morning. So I, 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 I'm treating it a little bit more like the list as it is given is kind of the list as we will briefly go through it. And we can come back at any point in time and we look deeper into any one of these points, um, but it is not my aim to spend a number of what would be months unpacking each one of these qualities, and we'll look at that as we go along. If for any reason there's some part of it you don't understand, anything you think needs explaining further, uh, then of course, please bring that to my attention and we'll do uh, all we can to, to get that outlined in a different way for you this morning. So these are seven verses, 17 qualifications, two of which that we looked at uh, last week, and, uh, and we'll try and get through uh, uh, the other uh, uh, probably 11 uh, this morning, and then that will leave us probably one more message or two at most as we go. But let's bow and pray and ask for the Lord's help this morning. This is the Holy Spirit of God's book. This is God's own book. We pray the Holy Spirit of God will lead and guide us this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you this day. Father, we come before your word, and I pray that as your people we come under your word, which is your final authority in our life. Lord, as we're looking at as well in our Bible studies, we want to be a part of the true church. The true church that Jesus Christ himself is building. And your word tells us you give good doctrine. And Father, as part of that doctrine, you outline the qualifications that you require for the men who lead your churches. Father, what the world may expect or ask is of no relevance in the matters of your church. So our Father, I pray this morning as we uh, briefly, continue treading through Timothy as we walk over and through these verses, Lord. 
pray. Give us what we need. It's not too little and it's not too much. But our God, you would guide and lead us this morning into our hearts. Lord, may we, as we again thought about it on Friday, may we place in our lives an importance and an emphasis where you place importance and emphasis. All too often, our God, we want to hear what we want to hear and we want to know what we want to know because of what we think is important. And our God, we pray that you would get our hearts and minds focused on what is important to you. In Jesus' heavenly and holy name we pray. Amen. I say that and I pray that because we certainly live in days and times where it would so, so easily, as so many do, to be steered by the narrative of the world and preach every single week on a topic that's like, yeah, that's right, pa, I don't know what to do about that, pass on. Yeah, that's right, bring down this to WEF, the Illuminati, blah. You know, some do, you know, they just preach all this highlight lollipop stuff so everyone can come. Oh, that was a nice ice cream. What shall we be the topic next week? Let's watch the news and see what's bothering me this week. Or oh, let's YouTube. God gave his book so that we can be grounded, anchored Christians, precept upon precept, line upon line. We go through the word of God as God gave us his word. It isn't that we don't address topics, but primarily God wants every Christian to be grounded in everything that he said, because then it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. We already know how we should approach it and how we should address it. Satan will quite happily, you know, set off rockets everywhere and we can be stargazing. Oh, there's a rocket. Let's, there's a rocket. Let's deal with that. And that's how many Christians and many pastors, unfortunately, today, especially, you know, the YouTube warriors, that's kind of how they approach their ministry because it'll probably get you views and hits and likes and all of those kind of things. And you end up with a bunch of moronic Christians sat in their living rooms uh, just going from topic to topic, from YouTube topic to topic to topic to topic. That's not God's plan. We emphasize what God emphasized. God emphasizes his word, he emphasizes his word, line upon line, precept upon precept, and therefore he does exactly that in relation to the New Testament church and this particular subject in relation to the pastors of the New Testament church. So we, we also need to understand that as we look through these uh, 17 qualifications, most of them have crossover from the pulpit to the pew. Only a couple of them are very specific to the pastor. Now, the pastor must, of course, qualify on all 17 of them. But there is absolutely no reason for you to sit in the pew and go, well, I don't ever want to be a pastor. This doesn't apply to me. Nearly all of these qualifications apply to you as Christians. They are qualifications and characteristics that the Bible talks about in other places that you need to have in your Christian life. So, so don't just switch. I think, well, I'm not going to be a pastor, so in the next couple of weeks I don't need to listen or whatever else because there is a crossover and you need to let the Lord guide you on those things. You are a part of the true New Testament visible church that Jesus Christ is building, that he purchased with his own blood. That is the pillar and ground of the truth that Christ gave his life for. And we've looked at all those scriptures before. We're reminded again that in God's sight, it is the most important institution on the face of the earth today because of those very reasons that I just said. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. He said, well, the family is important. Yes, it is. But it's not the pillar and ground of the truth. And that's important. Now, a lot of people sometimes struggle with, 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 with God's order. There's, there's three things in life, isn't there? Church, family, and work. Three main. Well, you put leisure in there as well, but I'm talking about important things. Church, family, and work. And a lot of people make the problem of going, well, yeah, church is the most important thing. Well, then you've got family is the most important thing or work is the most important thing. In terms of how you measure them and place them in your life, they all at certain times and on specific occasions become the most important thing. Primarily, the church is the most important institution. But classic example, whether it was Ed in India with Annie May, whether it's Sam and Jen uh, with Leyland, at this point in time, getting to church today is not the most important thing. You see, today, family is the most important thing because they have to be where they have to be. Some days you may be on a job as a, you may be a, like a paramedic or you may be on some as a call out to save lives. You may have got a call out five minutes before church to save someone's life. It's no good then going, well, church is the most important thing. I'm not coming. You see, God allows us to alternate those around, but it doesn't change what is outlined, but he allows us the liberty to determine what becomes the most important at any given time. But let's not miss that the church is the most important institution. But that said, the Lord gives us liberty of how we rotate those things around as he leads us and he guides us. 
And that's important. So the 17 qualifications are given to the men called to the ministry. They break down to the cover the, the four areas of character, personal qualifications, family qualifications, spiritual qualifications, and community qualifications. I want to try and get to the end of the personal qualifications uh, this morning, which is why we won't, uh, uh, you know, massively unpack them. We've got 13 of them still left uh, to cover, if you will. So uh, bearing in mind why that's important, because pastors will be called to give account to Christ for our ministries. We unveiled that last week. That's important. We're subject to the uh, stricter judgment, Hebrews 13, 17, and James chapter 3, verse 1. We looked at those verses last week. In these first two uh, uh, verses, uh, or verses 2 and 3, if you will, uh, there are 13 of the 17 requirements clumped together. Some of them do overlap. Some of them are similar but slightly different. And the first two we covered last week. We covered blameless and the husband of one wife. Those were covered last week. But we bear in mind why this is important because a pastor, just as much, or if not more so, communicates as much with his life as he does with his lips. And that's what God is saying. That's why he has these stringent qualifications. Because as, as Christians fully, what we say with our lips is rubbed out by the hypocrisy of our life. And isn't it that God's word doesn't have power, but sometimes we do our very best to underpower the word of God by the life we live that's attached to the things we say. And the one rubs out the other. Ever more so, with those who are called to be the shepherds, the pastors of God's flock, called to preach and to teach. God puts this on so that the men of God that he calls, there is not a great delineation whatsoever between what he expects out of character and conduct must match what is being preached and taught. Now, what is preached and taught is the holy, perfect standard of the word of God. Remember, we looked at there's a difference between blameless and perfect. There are no perfect men other than Jesus Christ when you walk the face of the earth. But that's what we bear in mind as we go forward as Christians and as we go forward of men in the ministry and any men who are called to the ministry. So we're just going to go through these as a list continuing on this morning. Verse number two, a bishop there must be blameless, covered it, husband and one wife, covered it, Vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Vigilant. What does that mean? Well, we should all understand that's not a difficult word, but in terms of relation to the bishop, in relation to the pastor, it means watchful. It means an overseer. That's actually what bishop means. Uh, you know, remember I said there's, there's bishop, pastor, elder, presbyter, you know, all these words are used. In the scriptures, they've got all different underlying Greek words. The bishop, episkopos, means an overseer. We didn't cover all of those in depth in the Greek, but all of those qualities under all of those names, under all of those titles, under all of those requirements combined together to show uh, the, the shepherd of the flock. Sometimes he must be an overseer with some authority. Sometimes he must have the wisdom to teach. Sometimes he must be as the shepherd, the poimain, the pastor, shepherding and caring for the flock. Uh, but in this vigilance, it really refers to the overseer, the ability to see the wood for the trees, the ability to see over everything, not only to see in a very narrow sense, not only to see the problems, the people, to see over it all, to see the end of a matter from the beginning, to consider the consequences of decisions for the entirety of the church and for every life within the church. So as the pastor, shepherd, you've got to be vigilant looking over the entire flock, but also not neglecting the individual sheep of the flock. That's why you've got to be vigilant, eyes wide open, spiritual vigilance as well as common sense. So you must have, God says, the capability and the capacity to have this wide, vigilant vision. You know, that circumspectness that is spoken about in the scriptures, to be circumspect, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Circumspect means having 360 degree vision. You know, as the pastor, you've got to have eyes all around you all the time, everywhere. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that Jesus Christ is building, but that doesn't mean the gates of hell won't try. Satan will hinder, Satan will let, Satan, Hebrews tells us, that's what the power of death, as God lets him. 
You know, every single individual Christian faces that opposition. Every single godly Bible-believing church faces the opposition of Satan individually and collectively as a church. And the bishop must be vigilant, the pastor must be vigilant to oversee and to look beyond to see the end of a matter personally and collectively in the church. Also in his own life, same thing. He must oversee, he must be vigilant. Remember, this is speaking about the personal qualifications as well. I must be vigilant. Every pastor must be vigilant. Every man called to the ministry must be vigilant and take great care in his own life to consider the end from the beginning. You know, even after what we were talking about uh, last week, and I gave you just one example, unfortunately, of many on Jack Scott, it wasn't but a few days later, Ed sent me something through on YouTube for a guy who was in the ministry, something I've never heard of, um, but apparently he's a celebrity pastor. I've never heard of him. I don't tend to follow celebrities. But, um, you know, he, he's not considered the end of a matter from the beginning, and he, it may not have created a problem, but, but he's just been doing some texting and, and bits and pieces, and it may or may not uh, be a problem. That's for the, you know, for the, for the decisions to be made. But we see how common this thing is, what... What we may find is he's not being vigilant. He may have been vigilant. There may be no problem. But the importance is at every personal characteristic, at every personal level, you have to consider the end from the beginning. Now, in some ways, it's always been easier in the past, hasn't it? As a pastor, you would communicate with the husband, right? Nice and simple. If, if, if you needed to relate anything to the family, whether it was for the wife or the children, to the husband. But we don't have that anymore. Sometimes you've got to communicate with the mother, the woman, or everybody else. So you've got to be very careful. Your texts or messages can't be misinterpreted. They've got to be very business-like. They've got to be very straightforward. No room for misinterpretation. No room for foolish jesting, as the scriptures are describing. No room for any silly flirtatious Comments, that kind of thing. You know, sometimes some of you have experienced some of my texts. If, you know, sometimes you, you may feel a little bit straightforward and, or blunt. Yeah, they are. I just want to tell you what I want to say. That's it. And particularly if I'm having to text, you know, Shannon, Lauren, the children's ministry, whatever else, smiley face, that kind of thing, maybe. But no, you know, no room for misinterpretation. And so I always err on the side of caution with those things. And, and it is always difficult, isn't it, with text or email. Sometimes they can be very blunt or they can seem that way because, well, A, I'm a man and I just, if I communicate, I normally just communicate what I want to communicate. That's, that's kind of it, which can be a bit blunt. But it's so, so very, very important. Vigilance. But that's for all of us as Christians. We all have to be very, very vigilant. All right, what's the next one? Vigilant, sober. Sober. Now, this is important. In this sense in the scriptures, this is not relating to drinking of alcohol and drunkenness in this particular context. All right. That's generally nowadays how we would primarily use the word, but that's not its initial sense. It's sober meaning sound, sensible, of sound mind and thinking, sober thinking. That's a, that's a phrase we used to use a lot. It's not used so much anymore. It's saying that the pastor then must have a sound mind, a sound, sensible, controlling mind, mind that controls his life. You know, all, all, all the thoughts must be brought into the captivity of Christ. You know, the Bible is, uh, 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 calls us to instruct those who oppose themselves. The pastor cannot be of the mind that opposes itself. He has to be of sound, sensible, sober thinking. He has to have a controlled, disciplined mind. Now, that doesn't mean you don't fail on that sometimes, of course. Everybody's human. But then we've got to be looking at blameless and not perfect. And that gets into where we were last week. And that's so important because what controls the body and life? The mind, ultimately. The heart wants to drag us everywhere, right? Keep that heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it, Jeremiah 17. The heart is what wants to drag us everywhere, and people of uncontrolled and unsober thinking will do what Hollywood tells them to do. Just follow your heart. God says, do not follow your heart. 
You see, the world's got one mindset, God's got another. The heart will take us all over the place. Sometimes the heart will get it right, but sometimes the heart will get it wrong. But if the flesh follows the heart, God says it's the mind that must make the tough decisions. When the heart wants what it wants and the flesh wants what it wants, the mind must go, no. All things must be brought into captivity of Christ and the word of God. That's for all of us as Christians. God says ever more so, the man who would be called to speak for the Lord. So why is that? Because honestly, I'm no different to you. Every single week, if I followed my heart, I'd tell you, well, probably 50% of the time I wouldn't be here, just like you. 50% of the time I wouldn't bother with half the things that I bother with because you know what? Sometimes they're hard work and they're unpleasant. Where would I rather be today? North at Bristol. But that was a good one. You know me, Penny. You know me well. Right? But I don't need to be there. I need to be here. My heart may be there, but my mind is here. And that's the difference between the bishop and the shepherd and the sheep. I am called to overcome my heart and flesh with my mind, to think soberly, to think sensibly, to shepherd the flock. And that's the difference because if I was in the flock, it would be, yeah, I can't make it today, Pastor. Well, if I thought to send a text, I'm going somewhere else. Feel like a change. Beach, whatever, right? We've got the liberty to do that. But I don't have the liberty to do that. And I'm thankful that I don't have the liberty to do that. But part of that is because God already tests whether I've got a sober and a sensible mind to make the tough decisions when the flesh doesn't want to make the tough decisions. Matthew 26, please. The mind controls the body and the life. Matthew 26. So this is more of a shopping list today, really. You know, kind of, Lord's given it to us in that way. There's much to unpack. But I'm kind of approaching this with just the quality, the characteristic, one or two comments, one or two scriptures. Matthew 26, verse, I'll get there in a minute, verse number 41. <clears throat> Matthew 26, verse number 41. Watch and pray. That's important for every Christian, isn't it? What's watching? Vigilance. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your flesh is weak. My flesh is weak. I don't have a different flesh to you. So what is it that strengthens the flesh? What is it that overcomes the weakness of the flesh? Sober mind, the mind filled with the word of God, the will of God, the way of God, the willingness to serve God rather than to serve the flesh. You will be assailed by what does the Bible tell us? The world, the flesh, and the devil in this present evil world. Your flesh is weak. My flesh is weak. You know, it's, it's like it's, it's so simple, unfortunately, the powerful antidote is in the simplicity for you as the, 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 the congregation and for me as the pastor. You know, it's, it, it's my formula for counseling. What's your problem? My problem's this, pastor. What's God got to say about it? Well, God says this, pastor. What are you asking me for then? That seems flippant, but it's so true. God said it, you do it, that's it. But my heart, not your heart, your mind, but ever more so, the pastor. Oh, God, you know, Lord, this flesh, this heart would do this. God says, I don't care. What did I say to you? You said this, Lord. And God says the same to me. Then why are you asking me? I've already told you. Do what I've told you to do. Sober, vigilant, so important. Why? First Peter 5 8. 
First Peter 5, 8. We were in First Peter this morning. Go to chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, which interestingly, in that sense, starts off talking from an elder to the elders, from a pastor to the pastors. Peter himself. But look at verse number 8. Be sober. There it is again. Not relating to drunkenness. Be sober. Be vigilant. God says be alert. Get your mind engaged. Get your mind in gear. Get your mind in God's word. Get your mind where God wants it to be. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, that's your opponent, that's your enemy, that's my opponent, that's my enemy. You pray for me, I'll pray for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, that's a general truth for all of us as Christians. We're all to be sober-minded. We're all to be vigilant because we have an adversary. We have an enemy who's seeking to rip your flesh to pieces, who's seeking to rip your spiritual life to pieces. That's a truth for us all. In that as the flock, I am called to be so vigilant and so sober-minded that I'm overseeing the flock. I'm watching over you for that lion. If you can't see that lion, I need to see that lion. And I need to then be able to say to you, the lion is coming for you. Lord Jesus Christ said to, to Peter, didn't he? The devil had sought to sift them as wheat. All of the disciples. What did he say to Peter? But I have prayed for thee. Peter, I'm praying for you. When thou art converted, brought back to his discipleship. Strengthen thy brethren. He was charging Peter with the watch of all the disciples. Overseeing because of the opponent, because of the enemy, because of the adversary. Back to 1 Timothy 3. Vigilant, that was number three. Sober, that was number four. Five. Of good behavior. Of good behavior. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. That doesn't need a whole lot of explanation, does it? To be fair, isn't that the result of everything that's preceded it already? You know, if you're blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, you know, if you've got all those things engaged, that should produce good behavior. I get that that could be subjective. But, but what God is saying is that the right-mindedness should produce the right manner of living. And so it goes for all of us as Christians, by the way. The mind affects the manner of our living. The mind must overcome the heart on many, many occasions. It's saying that the pastor must be of good conduct and good character. Both are required. You know, not some kind of foolish <laughs> jesting. doesn't mean you can't have a sense of humor, but it is recognizing where seriousness and soberness is required. Because I am watched of God. And by God, I am watched of a congregation and by a congregation. I am watched of the outside world and by the outside world. Not only in my individual life, in my pastoral life, in my shepherding life. And God says it's important. You've got to be a good behavior. Good conduct. Reliable. Honest. That can be a problem, can't it? Honesty. You've got to speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. But even then, they said to the Apostle Paul, well, we don't know what they said to him, but we know what they said. he said to them. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? I remember when I probably was not long saved. I remember when I first read that because it kind of I'd heard of the Apostle Paul, right? I'd heard of him. And you kind of hold him up as a bit of a hero. And then... As you're reading through the scriptures, you, you picture Paul and he's speaking to the church and he's saying, and I can picture it like me stood here this morning. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? And the answer is yes. That is the truth of it. When everything's good, I'm your friend. When it's not so much, the requirement on me is to speak the truth in love. 
But when somebody's going the wrong direction, the wrong way, let me tell you, then he who can do no wrong. He, oh, our pastor, he's wonderful. He's the devil incarnate. It switches like that, and it's that quick. It's that quick. You say, no, yes. So you're just making that, no, that's happened. That's happened in the past. It will happen again. It's important. You've got to be of good behavior, good conduct, reliable, honest. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, you've got to be a pattern in many ways. You know, Apostle Paul was a, was a pattern to us, wasn't he? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're to follow him as he follows Christ. That's all of us as Christians, by the way, not just pastors. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 13, verse number, well, we'll go from verse number four. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charith, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. That's why it's the greatest of gifts. And the pastor must possess that to not be easily provoked, but of, of good behavior. Vigilant, sober, good behavior, back to 1 Timothy 3. What's the next one? Given to hospitality. Hospitality, from which we get our word hospital. Hospitality. Bible says, God says to the pastor, I mean, all of us as Christians are to be, you know, careful to entertain strangers, aren't we? As we entertain angels on our But to the pastor, the pastor must be a person who is known for good hospitality. That doesn't mean meeting every need or every want, but a person quite simply who has an open home and an open heart. Now, can I tell you, sometimes, I think some of you will understand this anyway, it's easier sometimes to open your home than it is to open your heart, isn't it? You can open the front door, but you haven't necessarily opened your heart. You know, we, we've made it or tried to make it a pattern of our life around, you know, as the children were growing up, we, we try to make special and specific times that were for them when, when, when the doors by an emergency were kind of shut to every other need and demand and we spent some time for them. But we couldn't have made it always like that because then there's no hospitality. So right from the beginning where we've put up students and missionaries and uh, we've tried to open our home where we could open our home and do what we could do to demonstrate hospitality. I think that's important for all Christians, but it's a necessary requirement for the pastor. It doesn't mean you just give everyone a front door key and let them walk in and all, okay, your home is your home and everybody's home is home. But you've got to be willing to open that door and it becomes more willing to open that door when you actually open your heart. That is the harder part of it to do. What's the Lord saying? He says, you've got to use the resources as a pastor that God gives to me to minister to people. That's important. Use them for ministry. We tried to do that. We probably fail in parts, but the Lord has blessed us in many ways the more that we've done that. And over the years, God has always looked out and looked after us from the outside because there are so many things that we wouldn't bring before the church. There's so many things that I've made a point never to bring before the church. I've always gone to the Lord because I come to the church for the church, right? Because then I go outside of the church when it's us, I go to the Lord. And then when the Lord sought something, we want to use that to continue to minister in hospitality. I think that's important. It's a difficult, it's a difficult qualification. It's a difficult gift. Some people are naturally hospitable. Some people are naturally that way. I mean, they love their neighbors. They love talking over the fence. They love, you know, coming for a cup of tea, coming back. 20 years when we're prisoners, yeah, not so much. <laughs> not so much. When I, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't just want to talk to anybody when I got home. You know, just about managed to talk to my wife. How was your day? Like in my head, I'm like, oh, we had this fight, we had this fire, I had one swinging, hanging, another one, you know, stabbed another prisoner. Dude, that's, that's all in my head. 
What's the answer out my lips? Fine. What's the tea? That's it. It's kind of just a coping mechanism. It's a thing that you have for that kind of work, but it can make you inhospitable. Who are you and why are you at my door? I don't know you. Go away. That's it. You know, poor old Lewin and Neil, you know, they've experienced it so often and many of you go out in the doors. That would be me. Open the door. Oh, I won't F and Jeff. That's what I'd have been like. Inhospitable, except for the very close knit people to whom I was hospitable. Lord has to do work in there. And, and I've worked at that. I'm not saying I've got it's a work in progress, right? Well, I hope, I hope and I probably believe that most of you would accept there is hospitality at our home. I hope that's the case. If not, you let me know afterwards in private. We'll see what we can do to put that right. It says given to hospitality. Do you ready? to be hospitable, ready when the need is there to help to meet it. Come back to First Timothy chapter 3. What's the next one? Apt to teach. Apt to teach. Capable of teaching. Not only willing, but capable to teach. There are, there are many Christians who are good teachers. Many Christians who've got much to teach and many Christians who can be used greatly in any local church to teach on any given subject that the Lord has given them as a specialty. And that is great and that is wonderful. And every church prospers when you have that. But then you can also have some people who are willing to teach but not capable of teaching. And you have to have wisdom to turn between the two. But when it comes to the pastor, it's not optional. A pastor must be capable and able to teach the church. It's a necessity. It's an absolute necessity. And in teaching, if you wanted to look at that, we don't need to. You know, there's all kinds of learning, kinesthetic learning and so on, you know, where you, where you show me, you know, tell me, show me, let me do, those kind of things. But this kind of teaching is, is didactic. Our English word didactic from a Greek word. It just means lecturing. The pastor must be apt, able to teach in a delivered way. You have to be able to teach a group of people didactically. You have to be able to take God's word, break it down, teach it. Not optional. Minimal requirement. One of 17 must be able to do so. Hard for any individual to measure that for themselves, isn't it? But well, the church must know that about the man they call to the ministry before they call him to the ministry. They must know that. You must examine that. A pastor must have taught as well as preached before they call to the ministry. I'm thankful that I had that opportunity before this church called me to the ministry. I was used to teach. I had teached a number of times. And I pastored and taught the church for three months, solid when our pastor and his wife went away for three months. Good, bad, or indifferent, it was a chance for the church to measure. The Lord knew what he was doing. He kind of he kind of put me on sale or return before the church church called me to the ministry, right? It's kind of, you had a chance now, sling him out. It's not going to work. You had a chance. You, you knew what you were buying. You knew what you were getting. Most say, we weren't there then. We want to re vote. Apt to teach. Not only willing, but capable. Uh, I, I read a wonderful quote. This is wonderful. One whose delight is to instruct the ignorant and those who are out of the way. That's a lovely quote, isn't it? I couldn't have put that better. They're not my words. I got those in speech marks. Because isn't that true? It wasn't that, didn't the Apostle Paul keep saying that all the time when he was trying to teach the churches? Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. What's he saying? You are currently ignorant, but I'm going to teach you so you don't stay that way. The pastor has to be able to teach people from their ignorance gleaned from the world, from their biblical ignorance, from false doctrines to instruct those who oppose themselves. You have to be able to teach the word of God. It goes like this. Preach to the unconverted. Teach the converted. And do you know why? Because Christians will die on the vine when they're not taught. You, we should preach the gospel and the gospel should underpin everything. 
But when you're saved, you know you're saved, you're truly saved, you're truly sealed, you're truly secure, and you know that, then you need to know more. Making disciples. That's the replication of Christian life. When you're saved, you're sealed, and you know it, we love the gospel. But you need more than you say. That's why the pastor has to be apt to teach you doctrines of the word of God. The pastor must be rooted and grounded in the word of God. Why? It must be like a sponge. You know, like a sponge, they're, they're not so common today. Remember the old big bath sponges? Who remembers when we only had baths before we had showers? Who remembers that? I remember we used to go around to our, our grands when we were kids, me and my sister, you know, my mom and dad would be gone somewhere for the weekend and we'd go and stay over at my grand and granddad's. And we used to love it around there because granddad wanted, she had a bath sponge. It must have been about this big, you know, a big piece of sponge coral, the real stuff, you know, with all the holes in it. You, you can, some of you old people can remember those, like you're as old as me. And that thing would be on the side of the bath and it's hard and dry and you'd stick it in the bath and <laughs> this huge lump of water and you just squeeze it and all the water would be like getting a shower, wouldn't it? You have to use your imagination if you're not that old. God says that's what the pastor must be like. The sponge that soaks up the word of God and when he's squeezed, it's the word of God that comes out. Apt to teach. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Love to read the entire thing. We don't have time. We're going to read one verse. We're in for time. Psalm 119, verse number 133. <clears throat> this is the sponge effect. Psalm 119, verse number 133. This wasn't actually the verse I wanted, but it's a great verse anyway. Order my steps in thy word. And let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Order my steps in thy word. That's the whole point. It must be an ordered soaking up of God's word to give ordered teaching of God's word. Do you know why? Because most false doctrines, it's not that people aren't using God's word. Most false doctrines, in fact, Probably all of them. They all use God's word. They have God's word attached to them. They just don't use God's word how it's supposed to be used. Satan is very clever like that. You know, I, I, when I, many of you know, when I was first saved, I just assumed all Christians read the same Bible, believed exactly the same things. That's what that's what I thought. And the church I ended up in was Calvinistic. I didn't know that. It didn't mean anything to me at the time. And that's what I was taught with Scripture. I thought, well, that all makes sense. I'd hear it, get a verse, makes sense. But for the first four years, I was also reading the Bible. And the more I read it, I thought, okay, I'm seeing a disconnect now. I'm hearing that with biblical verses attached to it. And outside of the Bible, that makes absolute sense. But inside of the Bible, eh, not so much. And that's why it's important. Pretty much every false doctrine, let me say it the other way, every false doctrine that's held by true believers is the misunderstanding, misapplication, and the misteaching using God's word incorrectly. And that's why it's so, so very important, apt to teach. Back to verse Timothy 3. Verse number 3, qualification number 8, not given to wine. Now, we could park here for a long, 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 long time, couldn't we? But we're not going to. We're going to try and keep it in relation to the pastor primarily. We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks teaching what the Bible teaches about alcohol. And again, the very use of the word wine straight away is a problem because in your mind, you're thinking, damn, the off-license bottle of alcoholic wine. But the Bible uses the word wine to mean the juice of the grape from the cluster. So that's what we have to let the Bible determine our teach. But that said, let's look at the pastor first and foremost. The pastor must not be given to wine, not partial to wine, not attached to wine. That's quite simple. It's real easy for me. I don't drink. 
full stop. Tipped everything I had down the sink about seven, eight, nine months after I was signed. Never touched a drop since, never wanted a drop since. I can't be given to wine because I'm not given to wine. You know, the Bible is real easy in some places. Yeah, the discussions I have with people, you know, whether it's whether you get, you know, the, the, the women's hair, the men's hair, how long is long, how short is short. You know, everybody's looking for the borderline. Everybody's looking for the lowest. Kind. How close can I, can I get to being godly without being really godly but not being really worldly? Right? How can I walk both sides of the track at the same time? That's that's a heart issue. I'll get to that in a minute. All right. But for for the pastor here, here it's simple. How could you know absolutely? Well, as much as anyone can know absolutely. You know, if the pastor only has one glass of wine, is he given to wine? Well, now we're into a subjective realm, aren't we? Well, that that's not given to wine. Well, I say it is given to wine because he's got wine in his hand. So how can we know the pastor's not given to wine? If he doesn't drink at all. Problem solved. No room for any other. You know, I've got some friends, because, as you know, I, I'm in my own country, right? Prophet's not without honour, except in his own country. You know, and, and, and I still see some of, the, some of the guys sometimes that I've had friends from before I was saved. You share some interests. You know, one guy said to me the other day, he said, he said Stu, he said, you know what? He said, he, said, he said, you still don't drink, do you? And those guys knew me when I was drunk. I mean, not an alcoholic. I mean, we parted, right? And this is, a, this is a major thing to them because I, like them, could not, when I was them, imagine life without drinking. I mean, everything in this country is, let's go for a pint, see you at the pub, everything. New colleague, let's get to know it, go to the pub, whatever. Everything revolves around drink, doesn't it? And then you go, I don't drink anymore. Now, that's all right if people know you and you still seem fairly normal because they're like, that's odd. But we know him. For people who don't know you, you tell someone you don't drink, and that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> New guy started, doesn't drink. Isn't it? That's what we live in this country. That's what we live in. And, and I accept that. It would probably be real hard for me to just make instant friends now because we might get on we'll talk i can arrange it you talk on a range of subjects say hey, we're going for a pint so you want to come no thanks don't drink oh. the bishop must not be given to wine a friend of mine said said Stu, have you seen all these like no alcohol beers they've got now he said yeah he said he said they actually taste some of them they taste like beer he said, you could drink those, right? Yeah, you're Christian, you can't get drunk. You could drink those. He said, yeah, I'll get you some. I said, no, you got it. I said, the Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. I said, it's all well and good if I come out with you guys and we sit outside, I don't know, some restauranty pub thing on a glorious summer's day, middle of the Dartmoor, and we're all sat at the table, and there's me with a pint of non-alcoholic beer, and there goes Lewin driving past in his van, but I've got a pint glass in my hand with an amber nectar with no alcohol in it, and I'm just going, and Lewin looks out the window, crashes off, kills the sheep. He's like, oh, that pastor's a hypocrite. Look at him drunk over there. Was I drunk? No. Was I drinking alcohol? No. Well, I didn't actually touch that stuff, but what I'm saying is, could, could I'd have to then go on the explanation. Is it real? Is it not? Would my breath smell a beer? Probably. I don't know. I've never tried the stuff. Seems pointless drinking that to me. So isn't it wonderful when you can just say, I'm not given to wine. I don't drink. Haven't drunk for, I don't know, 16, 18 years. Not given to wine. Makes it simple. And I think the men that God calls to the ministry ought to make it simple for the flock to understand where they're at. No matter where you're at, it's where I'm at. And it should be simple. And I think every pastor should adopt that. Now, that said, let me just, I'm not going to unpack this. Let me just throw it out there. Should a Christian drink alcohol? I'd recommend you go through our study over on the side on there. Because you need to understand what the Bible says. From beginning to end, it's got no good thing to say about it. Don't matter whether you start off with Noah as a drunk. Woe to them that tarry long at the bottle. Woe to them that give the neighbour drink, the red eyes, the staggering, the da-da-da-da. 
Let me just give you one scripture in case it's new to you. Go to Proverbs 20 and verse 1. It shouldn't be. I don't think it is, but it could be. Because this, to me, I mean, you can argue the thing back and forth all you like, all right? And every Christian has liberty to do whatever they want to do. And as I say, when I got saved, I think I carried on drinking for about eight, nine months. I just got saved and thought Christians shouldn't be drunk and thought, well, I'll, I'll use the drink drive limit. I'll never have more than two pints. And I didn't. And that's how I ran the first eight months of my Christian life. Because nobody taught on these things at our church. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Now, this is important because if you're a Christian that chooses to drink alcohol in spite of studying the Bible or choosing not to study the Bible on it, okay, if you're a new Christian, it will help you along the way as the Lord guides and leads you to make your decisions. Wine is a mocker, not M-O-C-H-A. I hope you've got a Bible in front of you. Not a mocker like from Costa. A mocker. It mocks you. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Regardless of everything else the Bible teaches, that one verse says the very best that you can be as a Christian who drinks alcohol is an unwise Christian. That's the highest level that you can get to. In your Christian life, is God says, you're saved, but you're not wise. You want that wisdom, God. Now, that's a process. Okay, this is an occult. I'm not coming around your house checking your cupboards. All right? I didn't know churches to do those things. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Just take the time and learn what God says in its fullness. And the reason I say it's an issue, it's a big issue today, because it's not actually even a biblical matter per se. It's a heart matter. It's a heart matter. Do you want to be all that God wants you to be? And, and I know a lot of Christians, they go, you know, um, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 23, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. God says, I can drink. It's a heart issue. I'm not going to unpack all of that this morning, but bear in mind the context. You couldn't drink the water in Europe then, and they drank that wine diluted. To be drunk was shameful. Paul told Timothy to take that for his stomach's sake because he'd got probably dysentery or something. Okay, It was a medicine for medicinal purposes to hydrate him. But we have the whole counsel of God's word. And if you study the whole counsel of God's word, God hasn't got one single good word to say about alcohol and strong drink, not, not one. And every example he gives in the scripture is not a good example. And the best that you can be is kind of a, a non-drunk Christian who's an unwise Christian. But then that's subjective because you don't think you're drunk, but somebody else does. I'm not drunk. Yeah, you are. Anybody, anybody, you know, anybody who lived the real world life, you're drunk. Oh, no. Drunk doesn't think they're drunk. Subjective, isn't it? How do you know when somebody's not drunk? They don't drink. Problem solved. But it's a heart matter. If your heart is, well, I want to carry on drinking, so I'm just going to cling to 1 Timothy 5.23. You can do that. What I'm saying is you haven't studied the word of God. It's your heart going, I want to drink. I need a scripture to justify my drinking. I'd like to carry on drinking. And that scripture will work for me. You've got liberty to do that. But I would really encourage you to study the entirety of God's word. So you go to Romans 14, 21. This is the verse. This is the verse that God gave me. Again, I say I can't remember six, seven, eight months into being saved. God just hit me with this. As you know, some of you know my history. At that point, I was working inside the prison with addiction, addicts, drug addicts. Learned a lot. Learned a lot. <clears throat> I learned how easy it was for an addict to lapse or relapse based on the actions of those around them. Then as a Christian, I learned some people, clean-cut, wonderful living Christians, 
one of our missionaries saved from heroin addiction. I didn't ever know it. You'd have never known it. And those of you who met him, you'd never know it if we didn't know it, would you? And I was just reading the book of Romans one day. I was sat in my old kitchen. I remember it, your dining area. I'm reading Romans 14. Look with me, verse number 21. Well, actually, it's, it's kind of the whole, the whole section from verse 10 onwards. But let's, let's just pick one verse, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or made weak. God said it's good for us not even to do something that we could say, we can do this, we're allowed to do this. All things are lawful light, but not all things are expedient. And God says if what you do, if what you choose to do, causes a brother or sister in Christ to stumble, fall over, then God holds you responsible because God says you could have not done that. Now, from my work with addictions, here I am, six, seven months saved, right? I mean, I've got a full liquor cabinet. I mean, I've got malt whiskies and I've got this and I've got bottles of wine, a rack of wine. It's, it's all there, you know. Pastor had come around for Sunday lunch, glass of red wine, glass of red wine. Two pastors came around to visit North America. We're watching the football, have a carling, have a carling, crack, crack. And I thought anything of it. And I, I read the scriptures like God took a sledgehammer and whacked me around the head. I was working with addicts. And do you know how many addicts had told me when they'd relapsed, whether it was drink, drink was a particular one. And, and, and I heard a guy tell me one day, he said, I've been clean for so long. He said, I went around to a friend's house. They didn't know I was an addict. Didn't know I was a drunkard, alcoholic, clean, but an, an addict. Not drinking, been clean for months. So they pulled out a bottle of wine and he said, and that was enough. He said, the sound of the cork popping, he said, I could smell it. He said, and that was it. He says, you want a glass of wine? I said, yes. Full relapse. Wouldn't have happened now. He said, well, I'm not responsible. For everybody else, God says, you are responsible. And that verse, I got up from the table right there, and then the Holy Ghost of God put his conviction upon me, and I emptied all the bottles out of the liquor cupboard, all the cans of beer out of the fridge, and I put them all on the side, on the work surface. He said, didn't you take them around, give them to your mom, give them to your neighbor? No. Nope. Not good for me. It's not good for anybody. Down the sink it went. That was it. That was me done. By God's grace, by God's grace, I'm not allowed to drink. But by God's grace, God just gave me a new design. On that verse, that was it. That was enough. On that verse, coupled with my experience of working with addicts, that was that was enough. See, because I don't know, I don't know, well, I know most of you, right? But but I never know in Christian circles. And what I've learned is a lot of a lot of drunkards have got saved, a lot of drug addicts have got saved. And if I'm going to be like inviting them around, exposing hospitality, that's all it takes. I've caused a brother to stumble. So how do you fix that? I don't drink. Just that simple. Haven't you missed it? No. Well, perhaps you never, I was a party animal. Thank God is good, I'm telling you. We heard that last week, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Thank God. Now, you, you, you do. I'm just going to tell you the position from this pulpit is God's word is clear. Christians shouldn't drink out loud. Right? And study that thing out. Study that thing out. That's all I'm saying to you. But if you want one verse, Romans 14, 21, you study that thing. Not given to wine. All right, let's move on back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Just a couple more. Let's get through these this morning. Not given to wine. Verse number 9. Sorry. Quality number nine, qualification number nine, no striker. Now I can combine these with, with point number 11. No striker, but patient. And number 12, not a brawler. Striker, brawler, patience. I think those three combine. I'm going to sort of combine them this morning for the sake of time. Isn't it obvious why we can couple this with being a patient, 
person and not a brawler. A striker, somebody who hits somebody, lashes out. God says that the pastor must not be quarrelsome, must not be ready to strike a person. And I know why God says that. Because a lot of time you're like, I'll throttle you. But the Lord deals with that over time. That's how it starts. Who's ever heard the phrase, fake it till you make it? Well, really, sometimes that's that's how it starts, isn't it? You're just like, man, I just want to just, I don't know, cut off your airway, punch you on the nose. It starts that way sometimes. And you smile and go, well, Lord bless you. I'll pray about it. But inside, you're going, man, I, 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 I got a couple of hands for prayer right here. But it can't be like that in the ministry. It can't be like that in the ministry. It shouldn't be like that in the ministry. It'd kill you if it's like that. You have to be patient, kind. Again, you can see why that would be not given to wine, right? A few drinks. Some people become fighters. Because the Lord knows you cannot be ready to strike a person who displeases you because that is the ministry. Everyone will displease you at some time, and I will displease all of you at some time. So I'd appreciate if you're not strikers either. That's one of those crossover qualities of life. If you can. But if you do, make it a good one. Because if you don't put me down, you've had it. Because <laughs> it says that I only have to be as much as lieth in me, live peaceably. Once you lay hands on, when we're on. We're on. No, I'm only kidding. Not a brawler, not quarrelsome, not led to strike. <laughs> not, not, not prone to that kind of attitude. No, to be fair, I mean, that would have been my start place. That would have been my start. Again, 20 years criminal justice sector. I'm the boss. I got the white shirt. I got the epaulets. I got the sidearm baton. You upset me, I'm going to win. Simple as that. You can't bring that to the ministry. He said, well, did you bring it to the ministry? Probably at the start to some degree, greater or lesser. And then God changes you and he rubs you off and he gives you a heart for your flock. And then you don't have the same attitude in the same ways. One old saint, Whitley, said to prove his doctrine orthodox by apostolic blows and knocks. <laughs> but, but no. Believe what I say or else. <laughs> God says the pastor cannot be combative. You've got to be willing to contend for the faith, like Jude says, but not contentious. We have no such custom, Paul said. That must be seen in the pastor. We won't turn there for the sake of time, but it's Philippians chapter 2, all again. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And when he was struck, he didn't return it. And when he was ridiculed, rejected, reviled, didn't return it. We're following Christ, but the pastor is held to a higher standard. Why? Because God knows you're going to get rubbed up the wrong way a lot. A lot. It's not an uncommon thing. It's a lot. And if your reaction is, you know, 210 degrees every time somebody does or says something you don't like, then it wouldn't take long before that rolls over into striking and blows and quarrels. And that, that would just be crazy. That's just nonsense. But nonetheless, God shows how important that that is, that you must be no striker, patient, not a brawler. Let's jump to the next. Not greedy or filthy lucre. We're nearly done. I, I just like to finish this section if you'll bear with me. Not greedy of filthy lucre. To be honest, that one combines with the 13th qualification, not covetous. Greedy of filthy lucre, money and possessions. Not covetous, that's when you want what you want or what other people have got. You know, that's that's when you see, you do see so this with some, some pastors, turning to anything to turn up the finances. Now, there's a fine line between being a tent-making pastor, if you will, like Paul, sometimes you got to work. you got to do what you got to do. 
You know, the tent making pastor, we're not going to cover this this morning. The tent making pastor was used of God to write that the church should provide for a pastor if it can. You know, worthy of double honor, don't muzzle the ox while he treads out the grain, live off the gospel, so on and so forth. Okay, so where a church can provide for a pastor, it should provide for a pastor so that he's free to minister. But not every church can do that. We can't do that. So you have to be not greedy or filthy lucre because then if there's one or two things that happen, then you seek out ministries that are professions or careers that can pay you and pay you a salary, give you a house, give you a man's, give you a parsonage, give you a title, whatever. Because that's what you're pursuing. That's your end. That's your outcome. And God says, no. The other side is, you, you know, well, I need to work three jobs and do the ministry because we've only got, and I want, fill in the blanks. You've got to be willing to give up, to give away, to cast your bread upon the waters. And after what, many days, it comes back. You've got to be willing to do what needs to be done, but no more than needs to be done so that you can minister and fill God's calling. Money's not the root of all evil, right? The love of it is. The love of money is the root of all evil. Luke 16, 13, don't turn there for sake of time. No servant can serve two masters. That's what, that's what the Lord's saying. He's reminding us of that. No servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Now, money makes the world go round, and you need it to pay your bills. It's no good me phoning up EDF or Eon or whoever it is and saying, well, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister of God's word, and I'd like you to give my electricity free, please, because I'm minister. Don't think that would work. It's, that's wonderful. Can you send us a direct debit, or can you pay us by bank transaction? So you have to have wisdom and you have to have a good testimony. But your driver cannot be greedy or filthy lucre. Uh, what's the picture? Sat on top of piles and pots of everything. Give and it will be given unto you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's what God expects of his ministers. Not a profession, not a career. I've got another lovely quote here on that. The earthbound desires of a covetous spirit always clip the wings of faith and love. It's just about doing what needs to be done to do the work that God has called you to do. Give and it will be given unto you. Patient, we've already combined that. To have that patience, you need that wisdom from above that James speaks of, James 3.17. That wisdom that is pure, peaceable, gentle. That's the wisdom that you need. As a pastor, what was a working process? As we said, not a brawler. Again, that was combined with the 11th and the 9th. Patient, not a striker. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, in a sense, you're called to be a peacemaker, aren't you? As a pastor, you're called to be a mediator in some senses. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 9. You've got to be a peacemaker, a man who desires for peace. Not overcoming evil with evil, not overcome of evil. You know, knowing and trusting the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will trust in everything to the Lord. Trust in the Lord to judge righteously. Trust in the Lord to lead and open people's minds where you cannot do that. One more scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This will be the last. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Just a list this morning, I know, with some observations and thoughts. Just things I hope you'll take away in the back of your mind. Things that any men the Lord's working on their hearts called them into ministry will yet still consider, perhaps more deeply than they have. Second Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Not a brawler, not a striker, patient. <clears throat> not covetous. Sometimes covetousness will bring out a violence, won't it? You'll fight for things that you are going to get there. The 
the Masters qualifications. So very important. I can honestly say probably outside of Bible believing churches, very rare. Very rare. Maybe, maybe even rare. I don't know. That's that's your that's your tick list of me. That's what I was examined on, plus the rest to come next week, God willing, when I was called to this ministry. That's the list for you to constantly measure the ministry by. But may the Lord help us to always have a church that desires a godly biblical ministry, no matter who is in that ministry. May this church never settle for anything less. And may we as Christians accept those crossover qualities that is not just a list for me. Much of that is also a list for you that's covered in the scriptures. Why? Because like priest, like people, they say a pastor gets the church that he deserves. And I pray that God will keep me a Bible-believing Christian, submissive to the will of God, ready to be uh, always changed, conformed to the image of Christ, ever growing, never settled, that the Lord may give us a church as he has that continues in that same vein, that we may go and grow together as long as the Lord allows. May the Lord help us to put the emphasis where God puts the emphasis. And as potentially irrelevant as you may think those things to be to you, please don't take them like they are important. Father, we pray this morning. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness. We praise you for your word. It's so, so very important, Lord. It's so, many, so much that we could just simply take for granted. I'm so thankful, Lord, there are many things we just don't even need to think about in this church. But our Lord, let us never keep them too far from our mind. Father, you can change situation, you can change circumstance. And as I said just even a couple of weeks ago, we're only ever one man from heresy in this church. That's it. So, Father, these... These things may not be important today. I pray they're not important today in one sense. They're just a ratification. But they may be tomorrow. Father, please help me to lead this flock. Help this flock to love your word. And Father, help them whenever that day may arise, whether it's a man called to ministry or this ministry calling another man, to have those 17, not that we've finished them all yet, Lord, but to have them just burn and etched in our mind. And no matter what dazzling certificates may arrive, if those 17 are missing, that's not a man that you'll call to your ministry here. We thank you, we praise you, we trust you, we love you. Because of Christ our great Saviour, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.